All right, we had some big-time upsets on the NAIA side of things this past weekend. Back in the saddle, Matt Schlorzler, what's going on, man? Not much, man. Just uh, hanging out and uh, having a good time. Watched some NAIA football this weekend. And it was interesting, Kobe, because I really like to intermix my you know, non-D1 football with some D1 football. That's how I watch. That's how I get the most out of my experience, okay? And there was a game on this weekend, if you recall, Alabama versus Vanderbilt. I do happen to recall, yes. Yep. I I think a lot of us know what happened in this game where Alabama lost as the number one team in the country to Vanderbilt. And while it's not the number one team in the country, the number two team in the country getting upset at home is pretty up there. Northwestern loses their first conference game in a really long time, especially to no one besides Morningside. Like it's been a yes. really long time. Um, are beat by Concordia of Nebraska 29 to 17 in a shocker. Um, and I bring that up because obviously same breadth as the Alabama game, right? Uh, just an absolute stunner. Nobody was expecting this Concordia made it work with fantastic defense and it's important to note that they did get five takeaways on the day uh northwestern's quarterbacks would throw four interceptions combined and have one fumble that's not a recipe for success when concordia is not turning the ball over they're not a team that turns the ball over they run the ball they're consistent they they chip away at you on offense and their defense just swarms and they get to the ball they're very well coached and they just got Northwestern. Northwestern could get nothing going on offense. It ultimately nipped them in the butt. And Concordia was just able to use the turnovers to their advantage. They capitalized and scored 19 points off of turnovers. That was that was most of their points. So um, huge win for Concordia. They're always kind of in that tier below Dort, Morningside, Northwestern every year in the GPAC. Uh, but this is definitely something where they'll probably – they are getting votes this week in the poll um, yep. on every poll that I've seen. And they're they're building something pretty pretty sick down there in Concordia. So, Yeah, man. You look at those interceptions. The fact you have interceptions is obviously crucial. But you look at where they're happening. And the first one, uh, they're driving down in the red zone. And that drive is ultimately stopped, that Northwestern drive. The next one, Northwestern is on their own, like, 10-yard line. And they cough up the ball to the defense. And then you have a couple more even now as you, you roll back on the film that are happening around midfield that, like you said, it's one thing to also get the takeaways. It's another to go down and turn them into points. And that seems like uh, it's what Concordia was able to do really well in this one. And, and kind of like you said, you alluded to it, that's, that's really hard to come back from uh, from some struggles like that. And and that's almost what you need is some ridiculous stat like that to give Concordia an edge in a game like this, not to get, you know put down that team. But there's not a whole lot of other ways in which I think this result, uh, we kind of get this outcome from a Concordia team that, yes, I'm sure is much improved, but I don't think you would say something as drastic as they're on the same level as a Northwestern squad day in and day out, week in and week out. But that's where football is a, is a very interesting game. It doesn't matter. Yep. All those things don't matter. It's whoever shows up on Saturday. And uh, when you have four takeaways through the air, another one on the ground, that's success. Yeah, this Northwestern team is clearly struggling without Jalen Gramstad, and they've won all their other games up to this point. But it is – it is really tough to get things going when you've got to switch between quarterbacks, uh, Colby Duncan and Hay- uh, Hayden Gruce, excuse me. They each go for like 120 and 80 yards apiece, only one one touchdown between them and four interceptions. That just can't happen. And that's not something Northwestern is used to happening. Like it, nobody's used to that happening to them, themselves especially. Um and Jalen Graham said, obviously very happy. He had an opportunity to go play at Nebraska, the team you rooted for growing up. That's awesome. But man, there it, it feels like there's a big Jalen Gramstad sized hole in this offense right now. That's a very good way um, of saying that. And and you see the tape and you see some obviously some short yardage type situations where Concordia is able to convert. And you shared with me maybe a fascinating way in which they were able to make that happen. At that being nine offensive linemen on the field at one point, and you look at these pictures, dude. Oh my goodness, that is FU football. That is Absolutely. incredible. Um, and again, this is not something they're running, you know, this is no four-minute drill on the 50-yard line. This is a goal line package that they obviously have put together. But you see 58 and 60 looks like the numbers here are almost in that, uh, you know, two yards behind the line of scrimmage type deal. And this is just a formidable, intimidating formation. Uh, if I've ever seen one, dude, that is an awesome way to win a football game. 
Absolutely. And they made it work. This is Concordia football, though. This is how they play. This is how they've played. Um, this is the same team two years ago that had a fullback go viral because he wore a neck roll and wore like number 38 and made yeah. all conference honorable mention. Like this is what they do at Concordia and it works a lot of the time. Um, like I said, it's big for them to pull off this kind of win. And that kind of sets Dort up to be alone at the top of the G pack, which is something Yep, they've been up there, but they, they've never had that step on both boarding side and Northwestern, which they have right now. They still have to beat them though. 100%, and that sets us up to talk about our pick for the game of the week this week, that being the number one squad in the country, Kaiser. They survive against number six, St. Thomas. Matchup of uh, two of the best teams in Florida, my man. 31-27, Seahawks come out on top. Yeah, uh, Kaiser proving once again they are the best team in the country. Score, I don't want to say it's deceiving, because St. Thomas did mount a legitimate comeback, and they looked good doing it in this game. But it should be noted that Kaiser was out to a decent lead before St. Thomas started to build back into it. Um, but man, it is, it's very rare that you come out of a game feeling like both teams uh, have more positives than negatives, like even for the losing team. But it really felt like St. Thomas established themselves as a legitimate playoff contender. Anytime you can get within striking distance of Kaiser, it's impressive. Kaiser has just been absolutely blowing people out this year. And that's what they usually do in the regular season. For So for St. Thomas to, to come out and put up the fight that they did, it's, it's extremely impressive. And I think, too, in this one, it was fun to see Shea Spencer and Keeley Watson, uh, the quarterbacks for either of these teams, going at it, combining for three touchdowns. Uh, Shea Spencer had 270 on the day. Keeley Watson having 235 to his name. It was, it was a fun time to watch some offensive football. Yeah, man, you look at the first quarter of this one and you see it. St. Thomas, they receive the opening kickoff and fumble it. And you give the ball over right away to start things off. And then it only gets worse, I think, from there on out. 24-3 to after the first quarter against the number one team in the country. There were a lot of people out there that obviously not outwardly would do this, but they might pack it up, like right, kind of right there mm -hmm. and right then. Uh, this squad, a lot of fight in them. They outscore Kaiser 24-7 to in the second half and made things very interesting late, but uh, ultimately just a little bit too little too late for this uh, for this St. Thomas squad. Like you said, though, it's hard to do silver linings a lot of the time. I think this is one of those games where you can certainly go through and pull out a couple of those. Yeah, for sure. I should also note that for Kaiser in this game, Jaden Meisinger would get injured, which is a big blow to their backfield. He is the starting running back for them. Um, yep. Obviously, Andrew Burnett would do a good job picking up the slack. He is the second head to the two-headed monster in the backfield, so he did just fine. He had 100-plus yards on the day and a good day on the ground. But I do want to note something I feel like I don't get to talk a lot about with Kaiser receiving. They had a great day. Uh, Ref uh, Refeno Ben Gates. I totally botched that, but it's fine. Um, four catches for 142 yards and two touchdowns on the day. Usually that's a number being put up by a tight end for Kaiser or running back on the ground for them. Um, doing an absolutely great job through the air. Shea Spencer, obviously, back at the helm for that team. And uh, St. Thomas also had David Hayes, who had eight receptions, 143 yards at a touchdown. Him and uh, Keeley Watson have been a fantastic connection through the air this year. And on that Meisinger note, I think that's that's important too as, as someone who you know has gone through a bunch of surgeries on my end. He went through three major knee injuries in his high school playing days, and that was something I was mm -hmm. reading up on a little bit earlier. So really hoping it's not one of those cases that uh, something was re-injured. Again, I didn't see it. Live, I don't. I didn't see the play or anything. I don't know exactly what happened, but just hoping um, because we're just a fan of him and that squad that hopefully it's not something where uh, something of that nature was re-aggravated or made yeah. worse. And sometimes with knees and those joints, man, there is almost nothing you can do to like prevent the further injury. It's not like strengthening a muscle. The ligaments cannot be reinforced they can only do it so yeah. much i've got rebar <laughs> running down my entire leg because of it so uh there's a lot of stuff you can do but man it's tough and, and you talk about burnett uh obviously picking up the load as the rb1 over there for the seahawks but that is an entirely different dynamic for them now and that's going to change the way their offense goes down the field and that can be a good thing maybe they find someone else who can supplement him out of the offensive backfield but that someone is also not going to be Jaden misinger yeah, for sure. Um, don't know the severity of Meisinger's injury, so obviously hoping the best for him, like <laughs> like you said, Kobe. Um, but yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if they have a third guy in the rotation because Andrew Burnett kind of came out of nowhere last year. So 
I, who knows, maybe they just make a factory of these guys down there in Florida. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but no matter the case, I'm feeling pretty good about both these teams leaving this game. Kaiser uh, establishing themselves as the top dog off of an impressive defensive effort. Anytime you can hold Ron Tavis Farmer to under 100 yards rushing, it is a great day for your defense. So Yeah, we've talked a lot about the other offensive backfield, but that's that's a good note because we uh, he's been honored in some of our Player of the Week stuff, I think, through the past like season or two, and, and that's – that's a hard, hard area to crack. There are some ridiculous stat lines that uh, that come in every week for that. But let's talk a game that was a lot more one-sided, that being Indiana Wesley, and they dominate St. Xavier, number four versus number 13, in a game that was all Wildcats. Dude, I guess both these teams are big cats, but uh, technically SXU is the Cougars, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, but the Wildcats would be the mm. top cat of the night in yeah. this one. Very handily, uh, I uh, Indiana Wesleyan, excuse me, sending a message to the rest of the NAI basically with a giant middle finger saying like, Hey, we're, we're common, man. <laughs> like, like what Colorado says, man, that's, that's what we're running with. <laughs> uh, hopefully with more wins. I, at this point, more wins in Colorado, but uh, um, off the back of an incredible uh, quarterback performance from Kyle uh, uh, Antony, Antony, Antony. Okay. I think that's how you say that. Yeah, you um, say it a fourth time, maybe you'll get it. You know. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna re-say that. I had it, dude. I prepped that one too. That's the fucked up part. Um, okay. And Anthony. I'm giving you a hard time. Yeah. No, you're good. No, I love it, dude. I'm looking at this one and going through the the box score here, man. You talk about this Indiana Wesleyan defense, especially at home, though. But. Uh, Man, you look at this number, 95 yards of total offense allowed for this Cougar offense. That is incredible. 21 on the ground, 74 through the air. Indiana Wesleyan ran for 95 yards. It wasn't exactly an offensive performance from the ground game. But when you throw for 440, a lot of those things can get covered up, and that seems to be the identity we're seeing from this uh, I-Dub squad. Yeah. Um, Stuart Ross, who has been around the St. Xavier program for a while, uh, known for being a good passer, 13 for 18 on the day, 71 yards, an interception, and he was sacked seven yep. times. Not not an ideal day uh, if you're if you're Stuart there. Uh, Kyle uh, Antony, I'm going to say that right this time, oh, yeah. uh, went 31 for 45 through the air, 395 yards and two touchdowns. I mean, that is... That's a one-sided quarterback battle if I've ever seen one. Um, Isaac Smith on the day for Indiana Wesleyan also having 10 catches for 114 yards. And Ryan Whitwell with four catches, 76 yards, and two touchdowns. Uh, all that to say that St. Xavier still had a decent statistical day on the defensive side of the ball. Obviously, the offense, there wasn't much to note there. But Chris Swain and Ryan Fitzgerald uh, mounting the linebacker room for the Cougars there. Uh, Swain had 15 tackles, half a tackle for loss, two pass breakups, and Fitzgerald had 14 tackles, one and a half tackles for loss, a sack, and a forced fumble on the day. And this wasn't a case of St. Xavier going down, and sometimes you'll see teams that sustain these long drives throughout the entirety of the field, get into the red zone, and then sputter out, or maybe uh, that bag of tricks becomes a lot lighter and a lot smaller because of the limited kind of field positioning or whatever. They only had one trip into the actual red zone throughout the entirety of this one. We're not able to capitalize on that trip, and this was just a classic case of not running enough plays. Your defense is out there for far too long. Yep. And for a team that wasn't rushing the ball predominantly in Indiana Wesleyan, they still dominated time possession 33 and a half minutes, which when you're throwing the ball at that clip typically isn't kind of the way things go. So really for me here, it was a lot of three and outs for this uh, SXU offense, three of 13 on that critical down. And that when you can't sustain drives at all, that's going to be the recipe for uh whatever the opposite of success is, right? And it wasn't the case also. They're not turning the ball over a ton through the air on the ground, and there wasn't the four interceptions like we talked about earlier in the Concordia game. None of these crazy things that jump off the box score, but it was just a consistent effort from this Indiana Wesleyan defense that uh, quite literally just kept them off the field. Yeah, that's how you know it's a dominant performance because Indiana Wesleyan controlled so much of this game that there's nothing that jumps out as like, oh, this is the exact reason. Like Indiana Wesleyan yep. on all fronts just was dominant um and they look as good as anybody i've been i've been questioning this indiana wesleyan team i don't know how good they are uh haven't known i've been kind of down on them compared to the national media but man i gotta i might need to to shut my mouth a little bit because this yeah. is a real that's really what we call kicking the team. ass yeah 
Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of kicks in the ass, the Southern Dude. Oregon squad that we have talked at nauseum about uh, uh, on this program, more cannibalism out west, Montana you Tech. You talk about kicked in the ass dude it is me keeping up with the frontier conference every week yes. god <laughs> 42 35 montana tech takes this one both these teams have been incredibly exciting to watch i would love nothing more than to go out to is it butte i'm yes. trying to think of the actual city yes. but to go out and catch one of these order games that place looks electric and all of these games electric. are insane yes this is dude it, it just means more in D1 for the SEC. It just means more in the frontier, dude. These oh, fans yeah. are are rabid. Rabid. Uh, it's it's incredible. It, it's so fun to watch. But, yeah, Montana Tech getting it done again. And should be noted, they do face Montana Western next week. Yes. And what I'm sure will confuse us even more about this conference. I cannot wait. Um, excited for that test for them next week. But, man, uh, just an incredible day for Montana Tech. And this was – Montana Tech was pretty in control of this game from the jump. They would trade blows with Southern Oregon for a good chunk of this game, uh, but they would have a 41-21 to 21 lead in the third quarter. Mm -hmm. Southern Oregon would mount a comeback, but too little, too late. I Montana Tech just from the jump knew what they were doing. It was off the back of some pretty good offensive performances like we've seen from Blake Thielen, 17 for 22 225 yards, two touchdowns. Landers Smith, the guy, another guy we've talked a lot about, uh, 94 yards on the ground, two touchdowns on the day. On the Southern Oregon side, Gunnar Yates is still playing like the best player in the country with 139 rushing yards and yep. three touchdowns, 7.3 average on the day. Oh, and not to mention, he uh, also was their second leading receiver with a touchdown through the air and 78 yards receiving as well. That is ridiculous. Ooh. Shout out to uh, Montana Sports on YouTube for the highlights I just played right there. And you look at this one, two really high-powered offenses, which you could tell by just looking at the actual score itself. But I think a more telling stat is out of nine trips combined in the red zone, 100% success rate in scoring and finishing those drives. And, and the two teams, too, that the defenses are no slouch. You're not playing, yeah. uh, you know, Little Sisters of the Poor or whatever the, the analogy that some people like to make. Like, these <laughs> defenses are very stout in their own right, and so their ability yep. to finish like that was uh, was very impressive. Three of three combined on fourth down. You're looking at about 60% combined on third down. Like, these are all margins that are really good offensive metrics. Time of possession, very similar for both these squads. And at the end of the day, I think you you kind of mentioned it. Montana Tech able to get kind of an upper hand earlier on. And when you're playing really a good, good competition, excuse me, it's tough to come back from that when you have to overcome a multi-score deficit when the other team doesn't just lay down and stop scoring. So uh, I think that was probably the difference in this one. That's probably the most layman's yeah. way of, of talking about football I may have talked about in a while. But this is, uh, like you said, another week of confusion, madness, and excitement. Yeah, absolutely. And not to mention, like, this Montana Tech team also has knocked off Georgetown this year, if we recall, um, a team that I was really high on going into the season. And they have looked really good. But, like I said, the day of reckoning comes for all Frontier teams. And they're playing Montana Western next week. So they better – they got to be careful, man. Um, should be fun, though, seeing how the rest of this conference shakes out. No, I agree with you, and I think something that's really impressive about this team that we haven't talked about as much, we obviously talked about the win uh, for the College of Idaho last week in overtime over the Ore Diggers, 45-37, and mm -hmm. for both teams in a conference like this where you talk about emotional wins and losses and games that mean so much and games that come down to the wire like that, it can be very difficult to get up for each game every week. I'd be curious to hear from some of the guys that play in this conference, because maybe not a, a, as good of a question for you and I, but is that easier because every team that you play has a number in front of it? Or is it more difficult because every game means that much more? And if you don't come out on top, it's like a little piece of you is just ripped out and left on that field. Like that's gotta be, I would yeah. imagine one or the other. Um, but then again, you're, you're playing the number seven and now number eight team in the country in back-to-back -back weeks. I don't imagine the motivational talk pregame has to be too elaborate. Yeah, I think it's pretty easy to get up for games, but I imagine with how emotional these conference games are, it's it's going to be a lot uh, for them to handle emotionally. Should also note, Carroll College, kind of an unsung winner of this week after all that chaos in the frontier. Yep. Should be noted, Montana Tech and uh, Carroll College will collide for the second time this year. First time in conference play. Yeah. You heard me correctly. Uh, they did not play in conference at the beginning of the year. Um 
probably for a spot at the top of the frontier. Uh, obviously, we have quite a few weeks to go till then, but something to look out for. Carol's definitely a team to watch through all of this frontier madness, um, seeing how they kind of shuffle in all of this. Dude, that could be a t-shirt right there. What's that? Frontier madness. Frontier madness. We're going to have to incorporate it. that. I love that. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> but um, yeah, that November 16th matchup is going to be is going to be a big one. And you talked about it. They played earlier on September 7th in week two or really week one, quote unquote, uh, yep. of the season. And the GLIAC here in D2 actually has done that before when they were down a few members the last couple of years where you'd play a team early on and it wouldn't count towards your conference slate and then get them on later in the year. And that's an interesting dynamic, right? It'd be very curious to see. One, how a football team changes from that week zero, week one, all the way to like a week 11 type of deal towards the end of the season. And you're going to have different personnel available. You're going to have grown into your different schemes and have some guys playing some more meaningful snaps. But also, you've played the team before. You you probably know a little bit more of what to expect and how to handle them. And then I think maybe a bigger part of it uh, as well is the first game was on the road. They pick up the win. This one's going to be in Butte on November 16th. So that could be uh, kind of a deciding factor in that one as well. For sure. And this is actually for the frontier. This is a, they play teams twice a year less often now with the schedule because Simpson is now in the conference. So this is actually like probably a breath of fresh air for them. They're like, Oh, we only have to play one team twice. That's great. Usually they got to cycle through a few times, which is usually where all the chaos ensues from, but clearly they are jumping the gun. Um, because I don't know what to make of this conference, and I will say that probably until they are all either knocked out of the playoff or one of them wins the national championship. So, <laughs> Other games worth mentioning here. Baker had a scare versus Missouri Valley. Scored 23 unanswered, dude. They win 26-16, but that one did not start off in the fashion that maybe people had expected. Missouri Valley has had a, kind of a... Uh, tumultuous season is maybe a good way of putting it, but uh, Baker does yeah. end up coming out on top. Believe they're about number 20 in the current yep. NAI poll. The current NAI poll has Baker right now at number 19. Okay. So they, they've actually moved up a spot after that effort Hello. last week. Um, but man, yeah, this is, you got to win your stinkers. Like it's, it's important <laughs> to do in football. But it's 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 a rough look for Baker, who has already stumbled along the way a little bit. I still think they're a very quality football team. Obviously, a lot of things can happen within a game, but being able to rattle off twenty three unanswered against any team's a great sign. So, being able to get it done, uh, good for them. Curious to see what this means for the rest of their year. Yeah. 100%. A team that we've talked a little bit about on this show, maybe not enough. They're 6 and 0 now, the Campbellsville Tigers, dude. Undefeated yeah. still, 27-14 win over Cumberland, dude. This is a this is a pretty exciting squad and uh the tweet that I saw from uh, one of the coaches on the staff, this uh, kind of aerial shot of the drone a view of the stadium, a great atmosphere, mm-hmm. a sweet press box. Coach Allwood says recruits, listen, you want to play in front of this crowd. And that place it, it does certainly fit the bill. I think from an aerial perspective, when it comes to the NAI scene, this place looks legit. And there were a couple other great kind of game day atmosphere shots I wanted to share. But yeah, dude, at the end of the day, the squad is six and zero, and they've beaten actually some pretty competent teams to get there. This has not been a cakewalk uh, for this Campbellsville squad. You start things off opening the year against Pikeville, and that was a one point victory over mm-hmm. that squad. And then uh, some games against Weber International, Union College that kind of went their way. But again, some more quality opponents in Bluefield University that we know has not been a pushover historically, been a fringe kind of top 25 type team. Roosevelt mm-hmm. University, new to the D2 scene that uh, I think has actually, you know, without winning a game has actually been one of the most impressive winless teams in the country Roosevelt has. And now you go and you beat a Cumberland squad in the start of Mid-South play that seems like it could be a really statement win. Now, you look down the down the barrel here and you've got some big ones coming up. You know what I <laughs> yeah, mean? Uh, Lindsey Wilson is kind of disappointed, but they're still very much a good squad. And the Bethels and Georgetowns and Cumberlands down the line. There's some. There's still some teams there, but uh, 6-0 and is 6-0, and my friend. Mm-hmm. Going into the bye week, being able to rip off six consecutive, and now you get some time off to heal up a little bit and True. recoup for for basically what's going to be the gauntlet. Uh, Cumberland is a very solid quality team that they beat. Uh, probably metrics have Cumberland as like a top 40 team right now, mm-hmm. so not a slouch by any means. But, I mean, you after the, the bye week, you have to come out ready to go because you got Lindsey Wilson. Faulkner after that, you should be able to win, but then it's down the barrel against Bethel. 
uh, on the road, and then you host Georgetown, and then you are on the road to close the year against Cumberlands, who has also been a good team traditionally. Yeah, which I just it, realized as we were talking, I knew they were separate teams, but literally Cumberland and Cumberlands, and that was uh, oh, my brain did yeah. a little bit of a flip there. Yeah. I can't say I blame you, because yeah. uh, that happens a lot. That's the absurd. way I remember it, Cumberland was the team that lost to Georgia Tech 222-0 to zero, uh, in that fun trivia question, and Cumberlands is the, the Patriots. <laughs> I don't no know. I just re- I, correlation. <laughs> no correlation. I just remembered the the Georgia Tech score that I'm like, oh, Patriots, uh, Patriots. and Phoenix, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah, <laughs> so that is outrageous, I and I don't. I don't know if that's football standard. trivia now because of that. Yeah, dude, where where would you be without me for your for your trivia of the day? That could right? be a new section on um, what's it called? Trivia crack. You know, you spin the wheel. <laughs> Dude, that's obscure a NAI football Holy scores. Cow. Oh, yeah. I they just need to hire me for that. <laughs> It'd be great. But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna learn a lot about this Campbellville's uh, Campbellsville team coming up. Um, and like you said, it's a great environment. All the Mid South takes football really seriously. They all love it down there in that Kentucky area. So it's uh, it's fun to see them up and at them challenging this this big three at the top of the Mid South that we usually see. Oh, 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 oh,